Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast. So today I am delighted to welcome as part of my Mindful Meets series, the lovely Gail Tong from Enrichment Coaching. And I first met Gail through a business owners networking group and I heard her talk about confidence and her work all around helping people build their confidence. And I thought there's a real synergy here between what Gail talks about and the whole eating process and the behavior change process. And I thought it would be really interesting to explore some of that with her. But before I do, let me just say welcome, Gail. Hi, Laurie. Thank you for having me. It's oh, exciting to be here. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for um, joining. So, so before we get into maybe some specifics about how it relates to um, eating, I'm sure that our listeners would like to le- know a little bit more about you. So, so please do tell us a little bit more about Gail and, and how you came to, to start Enrichment Coaching. Well, a little bit more about Gail. Where do you where do you go back to? So um, <clears throat> I'm originally from Lincolnshire, actually. So every now and then you'll hear a slight word that doesn't you, you won't be able to pick up. But it's a Lincolnshire accent. Yeah, um, and my background actually is retail. So I'm a retailer at, at heart, I guess. But I always knew in part of that that I really love developing people. So to cut a really long story short, I um, went off and got myself qualified as a trainer, as it was back in the day. It wasn't this fancy learning and development thing that we hear about now. And I went off and I got a training role and I drove around the country delivering workshops and developing people doing actually what I really loved. Um, And as time went on, I ended up looking after a whole learning and development function for a retailer. But it was there that I really fell in love with coaching. And I qualified to become a coach about four years ago now. And I just I really love the the impact that it has on somebody. I love making a difference. And that's truly what coaching does. So back in 2019, I took the leap from the corporate environment into running my own business. And the rest, they say, is history. And so that that step in itself, I imagine, took took a fair bit of confidence. Yeah, it it definitely did. It was a real um, and Laurie, I'm going to bring this in really early. I talk a lot about pulling on big pants and getting on with it. Pulling on what? Your big pants, just oh. pulling up your big pants and going and just doing it. And actually, I, I had yeah, and I had to do a lot of that at that at that time to you know step away from what was a a great job with a great company I was learning a lot you know I was driving around in a company car I came and went as I please why would I want to give all of that up to to run a business so yeah there was a lot of confidence involved with that but then I would also say that I'm not confident all the time like a lot of people Mm -hmm. so you know I'm not confident in every situation which is where then the big pants thing comes in yeah I've just learned ways to manage that manage that confidence Mm. so you said that you wanted to definitely go into coaching and were there a number of different areas that you could have gone into I mean I'm just curious as to as to how you settled on confidence which I know is not everything that you do but it's quite a big part of what you offer to your to your clients Yeah, look, I think for me that confidence is actually right at the heart of everything we do as human beings. And I hear a lot of people a lot of the time saying things like, oh, do you know what, I'm going to have to fake this. I'm going to have to wing it. And I don't believe you have to do that. I firmly believe that actually once you've got a bit of clarity about your, your own confidence and what that looks like, you can then be your own confident self without having to wing it or fake it. So you think that it's quite a unique, so that actually state of confidence and that mindset is quite unique for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. It's unique to you. And what I think is a confident person or doing something confidently, you would probably think is, is completely different. Mm. So for me, when I work with clients, it's about really understanding what does your confidence look like 
and what does that mean for you and then I work with them to almost unpick that and say right how do we now translate that into into what you're doing and sometimes you know it's around their understanding their strengths it's sometimes it's about understanding their communication style so whilst you're right confidence is in everything that I do often it always links back to I just want to be more confident in this yes so I can see that actually it it underpins it doesn't it because that's if you like the positive platform and I think if I think about the work that I do with my clients there's there's a very very strong um, emphasis on getting the head in the right place and because it's about behavior change and it's about a change of attitude a change of mindset particularly if someone has say been dieting for quite a long time or has had a poor diet to try and enable that change to happen you have to start with a sense of it being possible and to create a sense that it's possible somebody has to have that self-belief don't they yeah totally and and one of the things because I've obviously done quite a bit of reading up around confidence and one of the things that I found quite early on was the latin word for confidence that is confidere which actually means to have full trust in everything you do despite the outcome oh that's absolutely brilliant isn't it yeah yeah and absolutely and often we don't think about it like that, do we? Because we go into things with, well, what if this? What if that? What if the other? Mm. But actually, if we went into things believing that we've got full trust in whatever's going to happen, whatever the outcome, then we've, we've already got a bit of a different mindset. So is that also a question of looking at what the possible outcomes might be? So sort of addressing that and saying, right, if this happens this is how I'm going to respond to it or this is what my positioning is on yeah I think so yeah I think I think that you can have a lot of conversations around what ifs usually those what ifs never happen but often to visualize an outcome is often really handy and I think we all know that you know lots of athletes do that don't they I mean the the best one I can think of um is Johnny Wilkinson who you know you you can physically watch him can't you taking that kick and looking and looking at the ball and he did that little dance and he was visualizing the ball going over I'm not I'm not a rugby girl but you know he 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 visualized winning um and I he won the world cup didn't he with that final final kick and actually I remember I remember being in the gym at the time when I used to go to the gym um and I remember that that it was on the tv screen and everybody absolutely stopped and froze and watched his kick and you know when you're watching something and it's so um fundamental or so important it almost seems to happen in slow motion and he kicked and this ball just went just went sailing over the top that's a little yeah. departure because I was reliving that fantastic moment because I do live in a rugby house because my husband used to play, you know. So, but yes, exactly. And I think that um, it's it's really interesting actually how many parallels there are because I know that both you and I work in the NLP space as well. And with my clients, actually, often even before I even talk food, you know, food is not always the first thing that we talk about at all is we talk about what does what does that end outcome that good outcome what does that eating behavior look like so it's not about numbers it's not about weight it's not about calories it's about behavior and that whole visualization really helps to bring it to life for Peter definitely yeah and one of the other things I talk about quite a lot is this whole act as if and it's about saying do you know what you're not confident or maybe you're not your relationship with food isn't great at the moment and you want it to be but actually if you were to act as if it was you were to act confident or you to act as though you had a great relationship what would that look like yeah because again if we think about um you know actors or soap stars you know how often do you go oh it was that person that played that character you can't actually think about who the person is you can only think about the actor or the actress that's played that part because what they've done is they've practiced and they've practiced and they've practiced and they've changed their behavior until they've become that person. Yes. Yes. And of course those little changes and those little steps 
gradually build up to actually embedded behavior and then it gets underneath your your skin and actually that that brings me on to the next thing that I wanted to to ask you about and and if I if I think about working with people who are ch- who are trying to change behavior around around eating one of the hardest things is to is to convince them that actually a longer step-by-step process is the way that 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 behavior changes but also the I think what worries people is that if it's going to be a long process how do I keep up my confidence how do I keep up my resilience whereas if it's for example a quick fix fix diet they're told by some you know dream spinner that they're going to lose two stone in a month that has a sort of tangible end and they're thinking right I've only got to do this for a month and then everything will be okay Whereas what I'm saying to them is actually it's a life change and it's a slow process and the slower, the better. And it's and I think for some people it's that's quite daunting because it means that they've 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 got to stay confident and stay resilient. So how how do you work with clients with their own issues? Not not food, I know, but when they come to you, how how do you help them with that kind of maintenance? It's so interesting, isn't it? Because often people come to coaching and maybe they've, so coaching is generally sold in packages, yeah? Because what you want to do is you want to see a change over that period of time. And often um, my clients will come and they'll buy a four session package because like you've just said, often they think that that's enough time. And you know what, in some cases it actually is. In some cases, you know, they've got all that they need and they move through it quite quickly. But often we might get to the end of the four sessions and people go, actually, do you know what, I need a couple more because I'm not quite there yet. They can sense that they're on a a journey. There's that J word, (laughs) that they're on a journey. Sometimes it's just the one that works. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and actually what they're doing is, and you referenced it a second ago, is about this whole small steps, these small steps that make a big difference. And it's not until somebody's gone out and they've taken that small step, whatever that looks like, that they can then step back and go, oh, well, actually, do you know what? That worked because I did this or that didn't work because I did that. And then they come back and we then reflect on it. And it and it's a learning process, isn't it? it it's 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 the whole um, neural pathways creating those new habits, but creating new habits takes time. Yes. And, it, and it's the same with eating, isn't it? I, I mean, look, I'm not one to preach or I'm sure we're going to come on to talk about my experiences with dieting and eating. But um, these small habits make a big change. And I, I was also thinking about the whole kind of willpower as mm-hmm. well. You need a certain amount of willpower, whatever that whatever that looks like. You need that for eating mindfully, but you also need that for confidence because you have to keep that going. So I think when I work with clients, I whilst I'm probably their biggest challenger, um, I'm quite direct. There's, you know, I'm not I'm not a fluffy kind of coach, but I'll also be their biggest champion. So I'll help to keep them on that journey on on their way, you know, even if it's a text or a voice note or something like that that just helps them. So it's front and centre. Yeah. And they can still visualise where they're heading to on that journey and what that output looks like. Yes. And would you agree also that this whole process will have ups and downs and that and that if you think about the transformation change cycle, that there is there is a definite relapse part of that. And actually that that accepting that that process will have moments when it's not perfect and it's never ever going to be perfect and that there'll be moments when things will go wrong but but that that moment itself is not the important thing the important thing is then how you then get back to to that action phase and you get yourself back on the horse if you like or back on the wagon and you and you keep keep going so how do you help people with those sorts of maybe that internal dialogue to be able to have some perspective around the relapses. Yeah, you're so right, aren't you? And we have this almost this swing, don't we, of, oh, uh, that didn't go quite so well. And and I'm also a big believer in, do you know, what? we never make a wrong decision because whatever happens, we're going to learn from it. So even if we did go back on the whole change thing, we're going to learn from from what we've made. So I think in terms of helping people where things don't quite go how they'd planned 
we'd also I, I would help them to unpick that and break that right down and say right okay so what was good in that situation and often they can't they can't hear that but talking that through with somebody I often hear my clients go oh now I've said that out loud that sounds ridiculous or they might say um oh actually I hadn't thought about it like that but all I'm doing is repeating back to them what they've told me so that they can hear it and it's it's this whole thing is you know what if you wouldn't say it to a friend don't say it to yourself we're our own worst critics yeah yeah absolutely and I think that I think there are two things there that is it is this thing about knowing how to unpick why we've done something so in terms of eating behavior which is our main focus unpicking what the drivers were and what led to it but of course also and this picks up on your inner critic point that that I think we're going to we should explore actually not beating yourself up about it you know and that is just key and particularly in the whole world of eating because it's so driven by how we feel about ourselves and emotions if we if we criticize ourselves for eating something which we perceive as bad then that's a potential driver for just a repetition of that whole behavior so trying to park or rationalize or give that inner critic a good talking to which takes us I suppose almost back to the top of our conversation about having a positive platform is really really key because as you say we can be really 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 tough on ourselves can't we yeah and again I talk I talk a lot about the inner critic as well and I think or inner voice or you know everybody has it it's that voice of self-doubt that tells us you know we shouldn't do this or we can't have that or we can't we can't do that but I think that it's important to remember that our inner critic only ever sees things in black and white so you know there's no gray areas with your inner critic it's either this or it's that and it and it's nothing in between and they're they are rude they can be really really rude but I talk about how ways to manage it you're never going to get rid of that that voice in your head I talk about about ways of how you can manage it because you're never going to get rid of that inner critic because it's there it's hardwired um and one of the things that I do are my inner critics called Betty now (laughs) no offense if you're called Betty and you're listening out there but the reason I call mine Betty is because Betty's a lovely old friend often outstays her welcome Mm. but actually Betty I feel like I can be really firm with her. And when she's saying to me, oh, Gail, you probably shouldn't really do that. I'm not able to say, do you know what, Betty? It's okay. I've got this. I can do this. Mm-hmm. Thanks for your, because I know you're only trying to protect me. Thank you for that. Um, and by giving Betty a name, what I've done is I've distanced myself from her or it or your inner critic. Yes. And I've taken away some of its power already because I'm able to talk to to her to her to Betty gosh people can't see me but I am nodding like a furious nodding person and I will tell you why and that is because this I hadn't expected this to come up actually but but the biggest the biggest tool the biggest action that worked in me fixing my 40 years of disordered eating was to distance myself from the behavior and from those those cues and those messages which are essentially your subconscious giving you what it thinks you need and actually mine is my greedy gremlin and in fact on my blog there's an article about it um and and since I started the clinic I've worked with three or four people who've suffered from binge eating disorder which is basically what I had I didn't know that and that has been the the principal success tool for them because as you say, the minute you distance yourself from that voice or that behavior, you can be more, more conscious minded about it, which means you're living in the moment, aren't you, of today and all your present day tools and not your yesterday baggage. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think we all have your, your greedy gremlin, I'm sure had phrases and words that it would say to you regularly, because Betty loves to say to me, well, what if, what if nobody likes that social post? 
what if you eat that and you know go you, you put on weight at the weekend or you know you eat too much and you feel sick or yeah. you know what 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 if what if and and I've learned and actually lockdown hasn't been great for Betty because I've heard yeah. her she's been louder mm. um so it's getting used to those triggers isn't it as well yes. of right wh- when is when is Betty or when is that greedy gremlin going to come back and how do I now deal with them yes exactly and actually helping people have those those phrases that that inner dialogue and I and I think actually you know some people might be li- listening to us and thinking these two are a complete pair of nutters to actually talking to people about the fact that the subconscious mind actually does have its own identity you know and this idea of separating it and personalizing it takes a little bit of getting used to for some people because it's not how they normally think about how they behave or they in their head but it is a thing it is definitely a yeah thing. definitely and and also I think what happened what has happened over the years is we accept it we can hear the noise of the inner critic or the inner voice or whatever it is and we accept it as just this background noise but actually we don't because it's just the norm it's just the way we've always done things but we don't have to do that we mm-hmm. definitely don't have to do that yeah yeah spot on absolutely you mentioned lockdown there and I was and I was thinking about all the different ways that lockdown have affected has affected people and I'm I'm sure that people's confidence people's self-esteem people's Bettys are probably running absolute riot aren't they at the moment yeah I think lockdown's affected lots of different people hasn't in lots of different ways and I think that you know even if we think about furlough you know uh, and you know you think about the people that have been been furloughed and wondering what's going to happen that we're into that whole kind of self-doubt and self-questioning again Mm -hmm. aren't we Mm -hmm. and also I think then there are there are other people that have unfortunately been made redundant you know how are they now feeling I'm wondering whether they're going to be able to get another job and what that looks like and I've worked with a couple of people in lockdown who have been in that situation and actually you know they're doing okay we've done work on again the strengths understanding what their confidence looks like and I've got one lady at the moment who I've been working with for a few months who has we've done a lot of this work and we started right at the very beginning by saying you know what what do you want your confidence to look like um, and she's done a lot of work she's done all the work here by the way so she said to me the other day that actually um I've I've given her the big pants and she's pulled them up so so we're back to that willpower and wanting to do it again mm. but she is now in a role so through her focus and not losing sight of that yeah. she's worked her way through lockdown but it's been really tough and it and it you know and I would even say it's probably not my confidence as well you know been running a business since 2019 came right into the middle of a pandemic and Betty loves to say what if all of this doesn't work out Gail of course she does yeah and I suppose that in in a sort of a roundabout way although I think a lot of people before they embark on this kind of development need need to feel that everything is in place and need to feel that things around them are quite secure in a way from a confidence position, at, even if your job or what's going to happen next isn't that secure, you can actually turn that around and say, well, at least I can make myself feel secure within myself. I can work on my personal resilience so that when the world opens up again, I'm going to be better for it. I mean, it's almost like um, we're almost in a bit of a, some of us, a stagnant sort of um, pedestrian type phase, aren't we? Where actually it could be the time to devote to ourselves if we're in between jobs or we're furloughed or we, do you know what I mean? It's a sort Mm -hmm. of a, it's actually quite a constructive hiatus, you could say, or we could turn it round into that. Yeah, and I think the thing here is, Laurie, that we always have a choice. We can always choose to work on ourselves or not to we we always have a choice we can choose to think about think more positively about how we see ourselves you know we can choose to think about actually they say there was a great quote wasn't there from Maya Angelou that said you know the the greatest thing is getting over how we think about ourselves 
Yes. And I and I love that because actually we're back to that whole we're our harshest critics. Yeah. But if we just take a moment to stop and to choose how we want to think about ourselves, then the world might be a bit of a different place. Yes, absolutely, because it's our perspective looking looking out and there's that there's that adage isn't there that you can't change anyone else you can only change yourself and you can only change your perspective of the world you know and that's and that and that is yeah and and one of the things that I that I from the first lockdown right through to now was one of the things that I really believe in is this control the controllables you know you and you've just said it you can't control what's happening to us in terms of the pandemic and we can keep using that as an excuse as much as we want Mm -hmm. but actually why waste time on the things that you can't control just focus on the things that you can control and you'll feel you're much better for it yeah 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 yeah, absolutely um and you said you touched on earlier your your you've had your own personal journey with Mr. Weight Watchers and and stuff. Do you want to tell tell us a little bit about that? Because most not not exclusively, but a lot of my listeners are obviously interested in other people's experiences of the whole dieting process and where they've got to now and what works for them. And so it'd be really interesting to hear as much as you want to share about your yeah. own experience. So I guess uh, I try to look back and think, right, okay, I know that I was. Um, when I was younger right, I was a dancer I mean you wouldn't believe it now would you but I went dancing school was always pretty fit I think it probably changed for me when I went to university so you go to uni you know you don't I didn't know how to cook or anything like that um, and, and as I look back now I can see you know takeaways all of that kind of thing until I realised oh actually this has probably got a little bit out of hand I've never weighed as much as I'd weighed before clothes were tight that kind of thing and the thing to do back then was to go to Weight Watchers so I've probably been a member of Weight Watchers on and off for a long time and I'm, I'm talking tens of years here and mm. if people could see you Laurie they could see that you I can I can feel it <laughs> But I guess some of it is that actually, you know, what we knew, no, we, we knew no different almost. Oh, Weight gosh. I mean, don't well. don't misinterpret my, my kind of wry, wry smiling because as any anyone will know if they've read my story, 40 years on and off Weight Watchers living world. So, yeah. and you're right. It's all that we had. It's all yeah. that, and it's all that anybody thought we needed in order to lose weight or to balance the eating there wasn't anything else really no and and I would say that it's probably and I probably didn't know any different until I met you so because I think what you've done and and we've probably I don't think we've even known each other quite a year but we've we've never met but we feel like we know each other quite well and and I think that not until I started listening to you and your work and following you and understanding you know all about eat the rainbow and you know have have peanut butter you know all, all things like that this whole mindful eating and and I I think what I've done over the years with Weight Watchers is it's become less about counting the points. And I'm sure there are people listening that will relate to that. But me and just having a little bit of confidence, I suppose, to go, right, well, actually, I know what I'm eating is okay. Yes, I've probably gone over on points for the day, but actually, that's all I've had. And it was healthy. And I know I've not gone completely off the wagon. I'm not going to beat myself up for doing that today's another day kind of thing so I think probably in the last few months I've started to think about that a little bit different maybe and maybe what I've done is had a little bit of confidence to take the bits of that plan that I like because I think the thing that I really liked about Weight Watchers in the beginning was that no food was off limits yes you know you could eat chocolate if you wanted to yes because I think when you say to people or to me in particular, you can't have that, then I want it. And I think that's just human nature. I think that happens with lots of people. Mm. Um, But I think that you make a really good point. And in fact, um, Hannah Wilson, who was on my second Mindful Meets recently, she was saying that although she really wants to try and move away from this slightly obsessive looking at a food and thinking how many sins is it or you know how does it fit into my number she 
what what Slimming World did for her was gave her a bit more of an understanding of nutrition or at least where the hidden calories might mm. be because she had no idea yeah. what the high fat or the high sugar foods yeah. were and so it did actually create a useful framework so I think yeah. that we have to give it credit for its initial education I think for some people I think you're right and and I think as well do you know what it almost it probably becomes a bit of a comfort blanket a bit of a comfort zone and you're in it because it's familiar and you know what the deal is and to make a change is quite challenging it feels quite it feels quite hard yeah and also I think going back to the points that we were discussing about trust and of course this is why it's a little bit debilitating is that is that we actually develop a trust in the plan and in that process and we lose the ability to trust ourselves and that's where over a period of time it starts to fall down I think yeah that's true actually because you might say you know you go out and you buy a packet of biscuits and I can hear myself saying to my husband can we be trusted just to have one or two (laughs) rather yeah (laughs) well yeah exactly exactly um and but I think I think you're right I think you know you do get into this kind of almost a trap and I think it does give you that initial education um but we said right that we talked right at the beginning about it being a complete life change because I know that my weight has gone up and down over the years um in actual fact lockdown's been quite good for me I've lost quite quite a bit of weight Mm -hmm. But I'm not so hard on myself now when I stand on the scales and go, oh, actually, I've, I've put on this week because I know maybe I've been out running or I've done more exercise. Mm. So, again, it's about that trust, isn't it, in, in the process as well. So do you think you're you're closer to a more intuitive approach now? You've got this sort of hybrid going on where you've still got an idea of what the points are in your in your mind, which is helping you with the choices. But you're well on the way to losing that sort of fear of food and that diet mentality yeah I think you're probably right I think you're right about I'm I think it's what it's done is it's raised my awareness I guess it's raised my awareness of the things that are um better choices I suppose better choices for for me and what I'm eating and and I'm really lucky you know my other half's a brilliant cook and we we cook a lot of stuff from scratch so I know that I'm getting we're eating the rainbow a lot of the time Mm. and I guess like a lot of people my biggest downfall is the sweet is the sweet things but again then it's about and it's about that understanding isn't it and and having having just a little bit of confidence to go well do you know what I know that I've, I've got I've got the knowledge and I I can be trusted to do this and do this properly yes and to sort of understand where that craving is coming from whether it's Mm. habitual whether it's just a craving to have something sweet and actually and actually you you want to eat something different you don't necessarily want to have dessert every day and it's become an habitual thing and in fact just the process and the trust and the confidence to say actually I'm going to have a piece of fruit instead or I'm going to have a piece of dark chocolate because I'm not really hungry anymore I'm just having it because I'm in this situation where I have to have something sweet to finish off I mean not necessarily you Gail but I know there are lots of people out there that have this that immediately that they finish the savory the brain goes right what's for pudding (laughs) because that's just what it's what it's used to yeah but we don't need that every day um and certainly if we're if we're full after having our main savory meal then we definitely you know don't Mm. so yeah it's um it's it's about connecting and having the confidence to break that behavioral cycle because I think you mentioned earlier about things that become familiar are of course much easier to do even if they're a little bit destructive it's what we know and it's what we're used to and it takes some confidence doesn't it to break the mold because because we're not quite sure what that new version of us looks like and I guess you know and I guess that's why the the visualization thing you know works so well both in your work and in um, mine but um, before we sort of round this round this off I cannot let it go without coming back to one particular tool and any other tools that you want to just talk about and that is the big pants so 
<laughs> do talk to us about the big pants and any other I think I think you mentioned something about confidence cousins when we were chatting the other day but but anything that you think might be useful just to leave our our yeah so well if we talk about the confidence cousins first the first one I think that's probably most relevant to kind of your area of work is around um self-esteem so you might be forgiven for thinking confidence and self-esteem are the same thing but actually I quite like to look at them as what I'd call confidence cousins and actually they influence each other slightly so I think that the confidence is about this full trust in ourselves, but the self-esteem is about the view that we have of ourselves and how we can change that. So this whole, um, you know, self-esteem, if we think we're good at something or we think we're bad at something, we're going to look for evidence to back that up, whether that's good or bad. So I think the self-esteem confidence cousin is about having a choice about how we see ourselves and making the positive choice about how we see ourselves. And then the big pants for me has become my mantra around, you know, pull up your big pants, Gail, and just go and do it. Because actually, what's the best that can happen? You know, what, what, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. And I think what, when I use this most is when something's really challenging or difficult. And I just say to myself, come on, just do it. And then often I will go off and just do it. Yes. And the big pants are bigger than just that, because once you've decided to pull them up, you've made a decision and that suddenly feels like an action that then makes you feel more confident because that's empowering isn't it absolutely in in itself oh brilliant brilliant well I think I think that's a great a great place to stop and to just imagine everybody pulling up their big pants men and women incidentally so um Gail where where can people find you if they want to learn more about your your work So I, um, my website is enrichmentcoaching.co.uk. I'm on all of the social channels. All of the social channels are all on my website. The newest one for me is inspired a little bit by you, Laurie, is YouTube. Um, But I'm enrichment coaching across all of them. So Instagram, Facebook, I think Twitter, I'm enrich underscore coach. And I'm on LinkedIn as Gail Tong. So yeah, you can find me on all of those. Brilliant. Because of course, people from all walks of life work with you don't they absolutely um, yeah men and women yeah corporate arena corporate yeah personal life coaching men and women brilliant well I will put all those links in the description underneath um and I just want to thank you so much for for joining me for this podcast lots of really fantastic uh, tips and and insight which I'm sure will be really helpful to everyone who's been listening Oh, thanks for having me, Laurie. Bye.